Good morning, afternoon. Eh, it's afternoon. It's twelve ten, so it's after twelve. It's afternoon. Um, today was supposed to be a day that I was supposed to take Jerry up to Columbia for a medical appointment, but the weather got really, really cold last night and really nasty. It's barely in the mid to upper 30s. It's not even supposed to get to 40 today here in, in central Missouri. Um, in fact, according to the weather report, it's supposed to be rainy all day, but it's a freezing rain. So the roads are not only wet, but they're slick. Um, the uh, Jefferson City, which we're supposed to pass through, um, is supposed to get snow. So, Jerry opted to reschedule the appointment for next Monday because it's supposed to be in the 50s, but it's supposed to be sunny and clear. So, we'll see how that's going to be because that's how it's supposed to be all weekend. Um, oof. Pumpkin spice coffee with Italian sweet cream, which it's... The pumpkin spice coffee itself is a little bitter, but the sweet cream makes it more palatable. Um, I got on here this, this today for two main reasons. I had two comments in my last video that I wanted to talk about. Because one of them holds dear to me, and <clears throat> I'll try not to get emotional like I replied on her comment, I actually cried when I found that this gentleman passed away. And we are talking about the crocodile hunter himself, Steve Irwin. I never got to meet Steve Irwin, but Terry Irwin did a book signing here in the States, and I met her briefly. And um, it was for her book, and I think that was one of the books that I lost in the flood, which kind of upset me, but... Um, her book was basically about her life with Steve and all that fun stuff. Now, the Irwins still have their zoo down in Australia. They still have their show. It's called By Crikey on the Animal Planet. And I watched from afar Steve and Terry have two beautiful children who have grown up to be beautiful adults. Um, Bindi is now married with child. Um, I was happy that she got married. She found her soulmate. Um, her brother, and I am so sorry that I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Names right now are kind of escaping me. But he's become a, he's, he's become his father. Literally, his father. He tackles his goals, his dreams, taking care of the zoo full on, just head on, just doing what his father used to do. Now, the unfortunate accident that actually caused Steve to lose his <clears throat> earthly life was an unfortunate thing because the story goes that when he went diving to look at stingrays right before he went diving a bunch of scuba divers were antagonizing these poor stingray and they were in a agitated defensive mode and steve got just a little too close and one of the stingrays struck out at him it's an unfortunate event we lost a good person. We lost a, how do you put it? A wilderness warrior? Wildlife warrior? Something along those lines. Steve was kind of like on the opposite spectrum of what the Whale Wars crew did were doing. Steve was more a peaceful, act, a peaceful activist who went around the world educating people. Not just trying to educate people to stop the poachers. But educate the people on what wildlife really is, because there's so many misconceptions about various form, various wildlife. Um. So, yeah, he was a 
Can't do it, can I? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, but I'm happy to see that the zoo has expanded so much. I'm happy to see that Terry and the kids, um, Robert, why did I forget that name? It's my brother-in-law's name. But yeah, uh, Terry, Bendy, Robert, the whole Australia Zoo crew survived, thrived, and kept going, and kept growing the zoo, kept growing their outreach, basically, in various ways. Now, they have connections with people in Africa that have various wildlife protection um, camps, safaris, whatever you want to call them. Um... At my age, I can't do what I would love to do, which would be to literally create my own little wilderness preserve with American wildlife here in America and have the, you know, and reach out to the Irwins to have them come and see it and maybe help me improve it, um, expand a program to educate people, things like that. Oh, boy. Uh. I knew I was going to be able to hold it in. Never could. But anyhow, I'm just glad things have turned out so good for them. Sorry, today is going to be one of those days where my hair is not going to want to do what I wanted to do because it's muggy, it's rainy, it's basically a frizzy hair day. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, and the reason why I'm changing subjects is just because I don't have enough time to allow my emotions to affect me. The way it is. I know it sounds bad to be that way. But I have to focus and move on. The other thing was. Yesterday. Or was it yesterday? Or was it? Yeah it was yesterday. Um, yesterday afternoon when I got, got home from work. I um, grabbed a can of Mountain Dew. And uh, was drinking it here on camera. And. One of you um, noticed that there was writing on the bottom of the can, and it was a date. It was a date. The reason why um, that's, that, was, that happened, twofold. One, Jane and I, after our doctor's appointment, started, started to implement plans to help get my triglycerides under control because... I have two problems going against me. One is genetics and two just poor diet. My triglycerides. Now the average human being, the triglycerides are only supposed to be about 200. Um, mine were 1136. Yes, 1136. Now we know that part of that is genetics because when we discovered it the first time after we got married where it was 3,000, um, yes, it's dropped dramatically because I've stopped eating so much carbs, stopped eating so much junk food, stopped eating so much candy. Um, triglycerides, if you don't know what they are, they're basically the sugars in your system. Now the natural sugars in your system should be only around 200. But because of genetics and poor diet and consumption of too many sugary snacks or drinks or too much carbs, because carbs contain sugars, carbs make sugar in your bloodstream, in your body, sugars turn into fat. Fat is basically what 
unfortunately, the fatty tissue can develop in your bloodstream, causing blood clotting or other dangerous blood issues. Thankfully, uh, I've been keeping track of my blood pressure, and it varies from day to day. Some days are good. Some days are like, oh, boy, you know, are you having any problems kind of days? Um, and I don't mean just like emotional problems, stress issues. Stress does cause blood pressure problems, but there are very various other issues that you have to watch out for. For me, because of genetics and family uh, medical history and just poor diet in the past um i have to watch out for certain telltale signs of possible heart attack or 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 stroke or things like that um i am pretty sure when i go to see my doctor which is coming up here in either november or december i can't remember because I can't remember what she said in two months or three months, but she wanted me to keep track of my blood pressure. Um, I'm surprised I haven't gotten a phone call going at, yeah, Mr. Henson, um, come see me now type situation. I, so basically what it is, is we're taking a six pack of soda because I'm only supposed to have about 16 ounces worth of soda a day. <laughs> Um, that's what we're trying to drop it down to. And we're writing dates on the bottom of these cans. So we know this is the day you can have this can. If you have more than this can, you have to skip a day. Well, I have filmed today. I'm going to have more than one can and skip tomorrow and just drink water or unsweetened tea at work. <sighs> Either that or coffee and home brewed tea is going to be my friend here at home. Excuse me for a second. I gotta. I have a secondary shirt on underneath. Well, I have three tops on. I have a compression undershirt, which is supposed to help tone my stomach. And um, then I have a winter rise, almost thermal type shirt. And then I have my hoodie because it's kind of cold in here, even though the heat is at 68. I woke up cold. And when I wake up cold, it's hard for me to warm up. I may have to go digging through some of my uh, winter backup clothes for my winter thermal socks because my toes are cold. My feet have been cold. I've been having problem with uh, circulation in my feet for... Maybe about 20 years, maybe a little less, 15 to 20 years. And that could be anything from the triglycerides and whatnot causing issues with the neuropathy and other possible diabetic issues in my feet, making blood circulation slow. Um, some days they're cold and numb, and some days they're just cold or numb. They're never both the same at the same time. Um... But the other thing that this particular uh, person asked about or said it in her message to me was um, she's also a fan. Uh, both these people were fans of um, Crocodile Dundee, uh, not Dundee, that's a movie, Crocodile Hunter. I'm going to stop saying Crocodile Hunter because I somehow automatically think of Dundee. You know, Steve Irwin, the, cro the Crocodile Hunter. <laughs> Why people don't just use his real name, I don't know. But, of course, most people who associate Crocodile Hunter automatically associate the Irwins, I think. But anyhow, she was talking about how she was in Hawaii on vacation, and they were doing some deep-sea fishing, I think she said, and, and had a humpback whale come up to their boat. Whales and dolphins are inquisitive creatures. They are very curious that friendly um the only thing about whales that i've never gotten to see a whale in wildlife or a dolphin in the wild has either been on tv or an aquarium actually it's only been on tv because i've never been to an aquarium that had dolphins or whales 
But um, I am envious that you got to see a whale up close. Um, I'm not envious about the, the vacation to Hawaii because I think those that's one of the few places I don't want to go to for a vacation, mainly because of my own paranoia. Um, now, I've seen pictures of Hawaii and Fiji and a lot of other beautiful places that people go to for vacation, but um, there's hidden dangers that will always be on the back of my brain that won't let me or will make it hard for me to enjoy the beauty and majest majesticness of the Hawaiian Islands or Fiji or any place that has volcanic activity or va volcanoes. Um, I enjoyed, granted, Yellowstone National Park has one of the largest volcanic systems known yeah, known in the world, known, period. The volcanic systems of Iceland are are active, and you know that they're there. But Yellowstone National Park has a, what was the scientific measurement? Like one point something million cubic inches or feet worth of magma floating around underneath it. And I just kind of went, as long as I'm safe and it's not bubbling up more than just water, steam, and mud, I I loved it. Um, granted, I just say it's about 650 years overdue to um, erupt. Um, I think um, the only reason why it hasn't erupted yet isn't because of the fact that it's found, it hasn't found a soft spot because... The Yellowstone Caldera, which is where Old Faithful is, is all soft, thin crusted earth over three hundred degree water. Um I just I, I just think that the powers that be has decided that it's not time yet. Don't know, but uh, I hope I'm not around when it does erupt, and I don't mean around Yellowstone, but I mean around alive, because if that erupts or I should say when that erupts, it's not a factor of if, it's a factor of when. Um, yeah, that's going to create an ice age because the magma alone that it's going to spew out is going to basically wipe out a very large chunk of the western seaboard or the northwest, anyhow. Um but the amount of ash and debris, it, I mean, watch the movie uh, Day After Tomorrow. Um, no, not Day After Tomorrow. Is it Day After Tomorrow? Or is it 2012? 2012, that's the movie I'm thinking about with Nicolas Cage. When that erupts, yeah, it's going to be a global catastrophe. It is going to cause global disruptions. And once things start to settle, it's going to cause a ice age. And wherever humanity survives the initial catastrophe, um, it's going to have to deal with learning how to live in an ice age. But let's go back to what I was originally talking about. Well, watching, man, that must have been beautiful to see them up close. I would, I would love to see any photos you might have taken of that event. Um, I have always wanted to spend most of my life, if not all my life, in and around wildlife. I mean, my grandmother gave me as a child these back in the seventies these flashcards with the various different animals and their facts on the, you know, on the card. Their scientific name, their geological location, their habitat, their prey. You know, bits of, bits of information that just, you know, it's like... It's, you know, it was inspiring. And um, it's kind of interesting about my grandparents. I'm going to quickly talk about my, my, my youth. It was back in the seventies. Um, 
when we were living in Arkansas, we used to go up to my grandparents to visit them. They lived here in Missouri. We lived down in Little Rock. They lived in suburbia St. Louis, basically. Um, can't remember exactly the name of the town or the area. It's changed over the last 35, 40 years. Um, 40 years, yeah, 40 years. 40, 45 years. How old was I then? I had to be like six, seven, thereabouts. Um, they had a neighbor that lived across the street. His, his, we called him John the Baptist. He was an old Baptist preacher. And he had, now I don't know if they were his or they just this particular flock of pigeons decided to make his backyard their home, basically. And I used to try to go back there with my grandfather's fishing net to catch him. But one of the things that he used to say about me, and back then I didn't think about it because I was just like, what? Um, he had told my parents and my grandparents that um, when I grew up, I would be a, um, I would speak in front of the masses. And I'm just kind of like, me? Speak in front of the masses? I don't know about that. But now here I am. 40 some odd years later going, well, I'm kind of talking to the masses because I'm on YouTube. Um, does that make it his prediction or, or whatever he said true? I don't know. But that was just fun. Anyhow, um, like I said, I would have loved to see those whales up close. I'd love to see if you had any pictures. Um, I love nature. I, I won't deny that. I, I, something about being in the woods, or not even being in the woods, because I have a, um, I have a program on my phone that I can set it, and and it helps me go to sleep sometimes. And you, it's got no music. It's basically all nature sounds. You hear the wind whistling through trees. You hear crickets, frogs, owls, a wolf. You know, various nature sounds that you can hear out in the wild if you're mostly in the Northwest. I've never heard them here in the Midwest as much. I remember the one summer I did, I was in Yellowstone. And I was, um, it was a nice warm day and I had the window open. Because I didn't want to turn any technology, I didn't want to turn a, a air conditioner or a fan or anything on. But... I was able to sit there and listen to crickets. I had a bison at one point in time, one day, eating outside of my um, dormitory window. And it, what woke me up wasn't the sound of him out there grunting and chewing on grass. It, w it was the smell. Bison have a unique odor. And it's very strong and pungent. And I think that's what woke me up was the smell that I wasn't used to. And my brain automatically went, something's wrong. That's an odd smell. Something could be, you know, burning. Something, you know, weird. Um, but I, like, literally opened up my curtain to see what was outside my window with that smell. And there was this bison head just sitting there chewing on grass. And I was like, slowly close the curtain so I don't spook him and cause him to try to ram through the wall. Um, bison are, are, bison have poor sight. They can detect movement, they can detect smells, they can hear things. Basically, they've got excellent hearing. Um, I had a picture. I think I took a, a quick snapshot, and I just don't, I had a picture, I don't know where it is no more. But, to have such a large animal so close within reach of your hand was amazing because like I knew not to try to even though I had a screen over my window I knew not to try to push on the screen to, to try to touch him um, but just the fact of having a wild free roaming domestic not domestic majestic there's a word I'm looking for majestic animal sitting less than two feet away from me 
The only thing between it and me was a, a screen, basically. A screen window and a, and a wall, but still. But to be able to, at nighttime, sit out, hear in the distance your various wildlife sounds was just so peaceful, so calming. Uh, I, w I, I can't wait till the day I can have enough money to, to take Jerry Ann out there. Um, reservations out at the uh, at thing in or around the park is either a wait list or really costly. It would be smarter to um, have an RV or something to sleep in because the chances of getting yourself in a danger of sleeping in a tent is high. Um, I do remember the various stories from different parts of the park where people were camping in a designated camp zone and had a bear raid their camp, the campgrounds. Literally, a grizzly bear came into the campgrounds. Um, no, I, I, I... Being that close to a bear, no, thank you. They're more aggressive and more dangerous than a bison. With a bison, if you know how to react and how to move and things like that, they're easier to deal with than a bear because a bear... If you move away from a bear too fast or too soon or turn around, um, it, 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 it causes a natural predatory reaction of, oh, it's trying to run. It needs to be attacked and taken down. Um, that's basically a bear's mentality. It's like, oh, it's running, time to play. Unfortunately, play ends up, uh, you know, a lot of uh, damages to you. Wolves, on the other, on the other hand, are, they're inquisitive, they're curious, but they're cautious. They're cautious around people because of so many centuries, I shouldn't say centuries, but so many years worth of being hunted, killed, eradicated because of paranoia by ranchers and farmers and herder, uh, animal herders, people with domestic animals. Here's a little piece of advice. If you live in wolf country, one, you don't have to be afraid of them. They're more afraid of you than they than you are of them. Two, if you are a rancher or somebody who has a hobby farm, which a lot of people in that area have hobby farms up in Montana and whatnot, they have hobby farms, so they raise their own animals for milk, eggs, even meat. Um, keep your animals close, keep them in a, in a, in a pen or in a building, uh, keep your livestock healthy. Wolves are nature's, um, doctors, I'll call them that. Wolves are nature's doctors. The reason why I call them that is because, in fact, they have been designed with a strong olfactory, olfactory, strong scent gland their their noses are built to detect illness sickness injury weak or lame animals and that's what their prey is they hunt their natural prey when they hunt their natural prey they go for the weak the sick or the elderly because god designed them to weed out those who can cause more problems for the herd than needed so let's say you have a herd of cattle and you live in wolf country. You don't need to go hunt them. What you need to do is there's two ways to keep them out. One is build, they have specially designed fences that are designed to basically deter wolves from coming into the fence line. Two, make sure your animals are healthy. If you have a weak or sick or, or injured animal, and the wolves get into the your 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 pastures and whatnot, they will look for the weak and sick, and they will take those out, because that's what God designed them to do to remove the 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 animal that could cause more sickness or or mass death within the herd because of the sickness that the, that one animal has. Otherwise, they're not gonna. They might come 
close to your home and sniff it out and check you out and maybe try to mark territory. They do that for two reasons. Marking territory basically designates this is my land, this is my my turf. I claim this area for, for my pack. The other reason why is if they come close enough and become curious, it's because you've shown them no harm. You haven't tried to hurt them. You haven't tried to chase them off. You haven't tried to, to do anything to cause them harm. Now, I'm going to tell you a story that I heard, which was like one of these stories where I was like, I wish that was me. There's a story about a family who moved up to... This is before they brought uh, wolves back in Yellowstone. They moved to northern. They moved to like close to the Canadian border. And I don't want remember what state it was. But this was here in the lower 48. So it had to be like either Washington, Montana, North Dakota, or Michigan. One of those, one of those four states. Where they still had wild wolves. Um, but anyhow, this family moved up there they they bought some land they built a, a, a like a house and they built um they built they basically created a, sm a small farming uh, uh farming location and they were trying to raise was it cattle or sheep i can't remember what they were raising but they had livestock and what they didn't know was the fact that they, they had bought land and moved and built on an area that was claimed by a small pack of wolves. Now, your first thought is, uh-oh, they've got livestock and wolves, and they're on their on wolves' land. No. Funny enough, the wolves had no interest in the sheep because these this family kept their, their livestock not only close to home, but kept it healthy made sure that the, the livestock were healthy and, and well cared for. Well, the story took an interesting twist. The pack of wolves came down, had come down several times to see what was going on, but never interacted, never got too close to the new buildings, the new farm, the new animals, the whole nine yards. Because that area had plenty of deer and elk and wild game basically their favorite prey which is basically elk and deer um well one year they had heard noise not by the sheep not by the barn not by the outbuilding but by the house like really just like right underneath their porch well what they did not realize was one weekend when they went away and they had taken all the sheep with them because they went south. Basically, it was during the winter time. They went south for the winter time, took their animals with them. They came back and they were hearing noise and seeing wolves on their on their front porch, basically or back porch, however you want to put it. And they were hearing noise around the porch. What happened was while they were gone, the pack decided to dig a hole. Or a den, basically, underneath their back porch. Because the porch, the even though it was a wooden porch and whatnot, between the porch and the snow being on top of it, it made a nice, warm, insulated denning spot. And the alpha female had her pups. Well, instead of trying to chase them off or remove them, they put the, the sheep in the barn and left the sheep in the barn, and they basically installed cameras to watch for activity not knowing what would happen being that the wolves decided to basically move in while they were out but they didn't do anything to harm the wolves they didn't try to chase them off or anything like that and the wolves themselves did not do anything aggressive towards the family it was like a mutual acceptance it's like yes this is your home you built this but we needed a place for our pups if you don't try to go after the pups or you don't try to do anything to harm them, we won't go after you or your sheep type situation. So the family became almost adopted into the wolf pack because there was one day as the pups were getting old enough to come out of the den, the youngest daughter of this family was outside, not really like touching the wolves or playing with the wolves, but just sitting there watching the wolves. She had literally sat herself down about 10, 20 feet away from the den. 
and the pups. The pack didn't go after the daughter, didn't get aggressive. They sniffed her. They walked around her. They left her alone. They didn't try to do anything aggressive or rough. They treated the daughter like another child, basically, like one of their own children. Um, well, after this had been going on for about a week, according to the story, the pack had gone off for a hunt. They didn't go after the sheep. They went out for elk. They left behind one wolf. They always leave behind a nanny wolf. Usually this one, this wolf is the lowest member of the pack. The, the beta, I think, it, is it called a beta or is it called an alpha? No, not an alpha, a beta or a omega. The alpha is usually the, the male and female um, that are ahead of the pack. But anyhow, the omega or the nanny wolf um, didn't, she tolerated the child. The child never went within touching range of the pups. Well, while the nanny wolf was basically just laying, lounging about on the ground, a couple of wolf pups came out and started going to the girl. Now, the nanny didn't do anything, just sat up like a normal dog, just sat up, up watched everything. Didn't growl, didn't bark, didn't do anything aggressive to scare the children or take the pups away. Just sat there and watched. The pup, one of them, actually crawled into this little girl's lap and let the girl play with it. Now, when the rest of the pack came by, came back from the hunt, they brought chunks of meat for the nanny and starting to wean the, the pups off of mom's milk. To the surprise of the parents of this little girl, no aggression, nothing. One of the alphas, probably the, the female, because usually it's the female that's more nursing or nourishing, nur nourishing, nur nurturing, keep on getting my words wrong, came up to the little girl and basically didn't like snatch the pup that she was playing with or get aggressive toward the little girl, started to basically gently rub on the little girl, literally flopped on her on her backside and, you know, was rolling around on the little girl's lap, basically. Not harmful, not aggressive. The girl didn't get scared or anything like that. In fact, the parents were sitting on the porch watching the whole thing. Just They stood up and like, okay, do we have to go snatch our girl? What? Nothing. Nothing aggressive, nothing harmful. It was like mom was saying, "Oh, you're playing with my kids. I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat you like one of my kids and and, and rub on you to put my scent on you, marking you as one of mine." As the pups grew older and they the the family of wolves moved out, it became a mutual agreement that the wolves may come back, and if so, so be it. There has been no aggression. No harm, no foul, nothing. Literally, a family who had come up there, built a home, started a small sheep farm. They were using the wool to make their own clothes and, and whatnot. Nothing. All was good. That right there, that's the whole story goes to basically prove that humanity, mankind, can live in harmony with nature. Now, I would not suggest uh, going out there and trying to do that yourself because it was basically a mutual acceptance. You can't afford, you can't force this thing. And that, in fact, I wouldn't try that with like a grizzly bear or any other large predatory animal. Um, wolves are more accepting of mankind than, than other animals. One of the reasons why, and this is another story from the past, um, this is an old, old historical story. Native Americans used to live in harmony with wolves. And in fact, there are stories, many different stories, of whole packs of wolves living in harmony with tribes in the north, in the northern territories. Um, tri even, there's been stories of packs of wolves living in harmony with like the Sioux, um, Cherokee, Choctaw, Crow, um, and a few other tribes that I can't remember how to you know pronounce their names, but mostly the plains and the nor northwestern tribes. To the point where the pack would would become somewhat domesticated. 
Now, what I mean by that is that the wolves would accept the, the Native Americans, would hunt with the Native Americans, would allow the Native Americans to take their fair share of a hunt, um, or vice versa, Native Americans would allow, allow the wolves to take, they would go out hunting and they would kill maybe one or two bison, let's say bison, because bison was like the largest animal roaming on, on the American continent. The wolves would take down their bison and the Native Americans would take down what they wanted. Never to the point of slaughtering a whole herd, but just taking down two or three bison to feed the tribe and the pack. The pack would live alongside the Native Americans, but would not like... They, they were still wild and the Native Americans knew that these animals are our friends and we are living in harmony. But if the pack decides to go off and leave... For whatever reason, we can't, we don't control them. We can't stop them. They're still wild at heart. They accept us and we accept them, but we understand we're not under anybody's control. They're free to do as they will, and we, the Native American people, are free to do as we will. Now, it's been historically proven throughout the world, various different tribes or groups of people have lived in harmony with various different animals. It is believed that the Vikings, or Norsemen, as the proper term would be, the Norsemen would take cubs, bear cubs, and raise them as pets. Now, even, they, even then, those animals might have been taken from the wild, Mom might have been killed as a, you know, because man was trying to protect his tribe and bear was trying to protect her cubs. Mama might got killed in an altercation. There's cubs. The, the Norsemen would not kill those cubs. They would take them in, raise them as their own, make them pets. And then there's been stories where the bear especially if it was a female, would stay around the humans who raised her, even though the humans would, would if she wanted to go, she would be nice to know you. But they would raise these bear cubs as pets, treat them as pets. And if they went away, because call the wild, they're wild at heart, no big deal. There's been stories of tribes in Africa that would take, I can't remember if it was leopards, if it was a big cat or one of the various canines, and do the same thing as the Native Americans, live alongside with them, even though everybody understood, hey, these are wild animals, if they decide to go, they can go. <clears throat> the only danger the only danger I can think of with that kind of those kind of scenarios is yes, these animals are wild at heart. The bear and the hyena especially are dangerous. Hyenas have a jaw strength that could crush a child's skull. Okay. A bear has the bulk and power to take down a, a full grown human being if, if it wanted to. Wolves, on the other hand, they're smart. They would rather go leave instead of attack their human counterpart. Now, there's also stories, and this, in fact, even up today, people do the same thing. It's called falconry. They would take a falcon, raise it from a chick, make it almost like a pet. A lot of falcons, when you train them, are great hunting companions. They can help hunt small prey like rabbit. Um, pheasant, squirrel, small animals, basically. They're not really capable of taking down a deer or something like that. But for the most part, a lot of people who had falcons back in the 13th century, back in the Middle Ages, used them for two different reasons. One, they helped keep rodents, rabbits, squirrels, mice, small vermin, as some people would call them, out of their gardens. Just having a falcon sitting on a perch over a garden 
deterred a lot of different animals from going into gardens. Now, for the most part, those who back in those days who had a falcon or were into falcon, falconry um, were usually the upper class people. I think the idea of having a falcon as a pet that you can take out on a daily basis and, and let it loose to fly around and it will come back to you or come back to your home and roost. Sounds like a great thing, but not everybody can do it. I don't think I could. Um, not at this day and age. Or at least not at my age. Maybe, god dang it. Maybe, sorry. Um, maybe when I was younger, but... When I was younger, I was a little crazy, if you want to call it that, out of control, um, unfocused, undisciplined. That's what I'd call it, undisciplined, because fact, I wasn't. I was too, I was too busy dealing with, with issues that I didn't know how to understand. It, it's taken me 30 years to, to understand them. And I had to go through a lot of stuff. I had to do a lot of stuff to get here. But. <clears throat> yeah. Um, sorry I didn't write your name down in my notes. Because I usually don't try to um, point my finger at the person. But. I'm glad you, I'm, I'm glad you got the chance to see whales in Hawaii. Um. Uh, I'm glad that there are people out there who are like-minded who watched shows like Steve Irwin's, um, The Corwin, is it Corwin's or Kerwin's? I can never remember how to pronounce her, the, the two brothers that ended up creating a cartoon about them dealing with wildlife and animals and whatnot. There are plenty of people out there who have done things like Steve Irwin and his family and he was doing it way before he met Terry. Um, but even Terry, when she was younger, she had a, a big cat wildlife rescue thing up in her home, her home state. I can't remember who, if it was Oregon or Washington. I know it was somewhere there in the Northwest, Terry, the Northwest states. Um, there are plenty of people who are out there who do right by nature, who do right by wildlife then there are those out there who i'm not going to name names because it's, it's it's been all over youtube it's been all over the media um the only name i'm going to mention because in fact i think it's funny how she this person carol baskin i think her name was i don't remember there have been all kinds of weird stuff evolving around that group of people and all I have to say is, I don't know who you are, and I, I really, I, I don't, I don't try to follow these people, but if you're building what you want to call rescue centers for wildlife and whatnot, and all you're really doing is trying to build um, an empire or your 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 money that you're earning through the the your so-called rescue centers or whatnot is being used for personal gain, you're wrong. If you're not taking the money that's coming into you so people can see these big cats, these these animals cl up close and personal, um, one, you're being foolish. Okay? Use your money to help nature. Use your money to help wildlife preserves. Use your money for other things than personal gain. From what I understand about Steve and, and his family, they lived on the zoo. They live, breathe, eat the zoo. All their money goes either into improving their zoo so they can improve education or a large sum of it, from what I understand, was going into various groups to help conservation. I have a wildlife safari here in Missouri. It's not even two hours, it's maybe two hours away from where I am off of 44. I've been there. It's small. It's convenient. 
everything looks kosher. I don't know much about them, but a lot of their advertisements, a lot of their posters, a lot of their stuff in the facility looked like it was going back into wildlife preserves, wildlife foundations, wildlife conservation. I don't have enough money. I don't have a lot of money. I really don't. Most of my money goes into basically my living. What little money I have extra either goes into a savings or once a year when they send me a letter, I send money to the natural National Wildlife Concert National Wildlife Foundation. I don't have I don't have my my booklet. But you saw one of the things that I got as a free gift for my donation, which was an over-the-shoulder um, bag, shoulder bag, or whatever you want to call it. My money goes to them when I can. If I had, if, if I was earning the money that I wish I was earning, I would be putting money into, like, the National and the World Wildlife Foundation. Um, because I think... Without our help, a lot of these a lot of these legitimate places would not be able to do what they do. So I encourage people to give what they can to wildlife foundations. Um, my I set up I couldn't set up I couldn't get the the thing that I tried to get up set up for for my birthday, which was I wasn't asked I did it on Facebook. I didn't get it off the ground fast enough or well enough or whatever. But it was, I didn't want anything for my birthday. I wanted people to donate to the National Wildlife Foundation. Um, like I said, it didn't get off the ground the way I wanted because I didn't set it up properly. But anyhow, um, I'm talking too much and I've talked too long and i got too much to do. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Um, if you enjoyed this, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and put them in the comment box. In fact... I'm going to set up something. I'm going to ask you guys something. So those of you who are viewing the whole thing and you've gotten to this point, you'll hear this this semi-request. Any questions you have that you want answered that, I, that I've talked about, anything that I've talked about you want to know more about, or if you have questions about what I'm talking about, put those questions in the comment box. In fact, I think I'm going to start doing a Q&A. <clears throat> it won't be live, but every question that is asked, I am, and it has to pertain to who I am, what I am, what I believe in, what I like, nature, things that I've, I've talked about in the video. For everybody who puts in a question, I will answer. And I will, I will start to basically, I will make a video answering all those questions once a week. I will start compiling a list of questions that you ask, and I will answer them once a week. If you do that, we'll start to have more of a dialect than just me talking for the sake of talking or for the sake of getting stuff off my chest. So go ahead and do that in the, the question comment box. If you're new... To my channel and you like what you're seeing or like what you're hearing or you like some of my past videos if you watched them go ahead and click the bell if you haven't and youtube will let you know when i put in a new video so until next time be safe god bless have a good day bye